Welcome everybody to Identifying Trees in Spring. Uh, my name is James from Woodland Classroom, down or up in North East Wales, depending on where you're watching from. And you're very welcome to uh, join me for about an hour of talking about trees in spring, how to identify them, and talking about all the changes that are going on in our countryside at this time of year. As we record this, it's the start of March, and we're right at the start of that spring season. But we're going to be talking through this workshop about the next three months and all the changes that we expect to see with our trees. And I'm going to be showing you as well some of the unexpected things that you might not have noticed before out in the countryside that once we really start to pay attention to our native and common trees, we start to notice all these little features that maybe we hadn't ever seen or appreciated before. So whether you're watching live now tonight or when you're watching the recording via YouTube, you're very welcome. Um, this workshop is going to last about an hour. Um, if this is your first time on the workshops, I do have two workshops which are free to watch on YouTube, which are all about identifying trees in winter. Of course, we're in spring now, so do go to the YouTube channel, Wooden Classroom, and check those out if you want to travel back in time and talk about bare twigs, buds, bark, and all the winter signs of trees. Okay, folks, so let's talk about what we're going to learn tonight. Okay, so tonight we're going to get a solid grounding in how to identify trees in spring, okay? We're going to be looking to study things like blossom, um, young leaves, uh, catkins, flowers and other signs. Um, I'm going to be briefly going over my three key principles of tree ID, um, which can be applied to any species. And we're going to cover probably about 10 species um, kind of in detail, but more are going to get touched on throughout. There's quite a lot of images tonight to go through, so I'm going to fire lots of information at you. Um, we're going to talk about the spring tree calendar as well, which is not only um, thinking about what to look for in spring with trees, but when to look for it and why that's really important and what's happening over March, April and May. OK, we're going to talk about catkins. And we're going to talk a little bit about male and female trees. Are trees male or female? And maybe spring is a time where we can really help to answer that. I'm also going to briefly touch, we get time on wild food opportunities with uh, trees in spring and the things you can eat, which are going to be out there either now or in the next couple of months. And then we're going to finish off with your questions and we'll take your questions live in the chat room if you're watching. And if you're watching after the fact on YouTube, you can pop a question in the chat room and I'll do my best to get back to you. And then, of course, I have an exciting announcement about where you can get a load more free resources and other good stuff about identifying trees all throughout the year here in Britain. OK, folks. So um, how to get involved. For those of you watching, um, you can get involved in the chat room. Um, tonight we have Lee, uh, my partner, monitoring the chat room and you can put some questions or comments in there. Um, if I see the same question coming up, I'll try and answer it live if a lot of people are asking about the same thing. Otherwise, I'll pick and choose some best ones for the end, or you can leave your questions to the end if you want to as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about myself, because some of you guys have been um, on a workshop with me before, and so know who I am, but some of you won't. Um, so my name is James, James Kendall at Woodland Classroom. Um, we teach uh, uh, bushcraft, nature connection, wild food and foraging, a forest school, all kinds of stuff in the outdoors and there you can see a bit of bushcraft there and some foraging with some lovely parasol mushrooms that we found and our aim is to reconnect people of all ages with the natural world and help them refine that connection and rekindle that using all these great um, themes like trees bushcraft wild food and more um, i've always loved trees myself the uh, woodlands are my second home um, my background is in environmental conservation and practical uh, woodland work and it's always the trees, the bushcraft, the traditional woodland crafts which I've always kind of steered towards and find myself drawn to. And I've also managed woodland as well. So I used to be a woodland manager for 300 acres in mid Wales of mixed broadleaf and conifers. So I've been on the practical side as well. It's not just theory. So I hope one day as well that I'll be the guardian of my own woodland. Um, so that was a bit of a pipe dream of myself so, uh, and Lee as well. So uh, maybe we'll be talking to you from our own woodlands someday. Okay, folks, well, that's me. Right, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about three key principles of tree identification. Now, for anyone who came on the winter workshop, you will have heard this already. And for anyone who's new to this, I'm going to just go through this quickly because there's a lot to cover tonight. I go through it in more detail 
in our winter workshop or on the free tree ID course, which I'm going to send you a link to. But just briefly, because it's a good idea to tune in to these three principles, the first one being tune in so we can get our heads in gear. These are three little tricks I always use when I'm out identifying trees. And the first is tune in. So tune into your environment, to your surroundings. We're asking, where are we? What's the context? And what do we expect to see here? So by that, I mean, if you're in um, a country estate, you are gonna get all kinds of uh, native trees, but you probably can get some interesting exotics planted in like giant sequoias um, or back to eucalyptus, you know, things that have been brought in for the estate for amenity reasons, um, because they just look nice. If we're out on farmland, we're much more likely to see just our natives, our kind of 32 to 40 kind of native and common trees that we get in this country. If we're in an urban space, there's certain town trees on streets that we would expect to see, like lime, uh, London Plain, um, Sycamore, things like that. You more likely get in urban spaces. So you may not know the answers of what you expect to see in your environment straight away, but the more you practice tree ID, the more you will begin to tune into where you are. So that's important because when we identify trees, I play an elimination game and I whittle down what the tree isn't so I can work out what it is. So first of all, tune in. Then principle two, begin with a branch. Everything you need to know about a tree is on a nice healthy twig about this much from the end of the twig to here will tell you everything you need to know, usually in order to identify the tree, because a whole tree can be quite intimidating on its own. But if you begin with a branch and just take that healthy twig, you'll have everything you need. And that's true in all four seasons. So start with a young, healthy branch first. And the last principle is we ask a question of the tree and this will come in. It was very important in winter when we were just looking at buds, but we're asking, are the buds or leaves arranged alternately on the branch or in opposite pairs? And that's important because some trees are alternate and some are opposite. And let me just show you what that means. I've got a very uh, simple graphic here which shows you we've got alternate buds or leaves on a twig there on the left where they're climbing up like a ladder staggered from each other. And then on the right, we have opposite twigs, uh, opposite uh, leaves or buds, and they are in opposite pairs. OK, and by understanding that, we can eliminate a load of species from our inquiry. So if the buds are opposite, like we have with this tree here, the elder Sambucus nigra, we can see straight away, oh, look, those buds are opposite. They're just budding out now in spring. There's the leaves bursting out. They're in opposite pairs. I know it can't be any of the trees that we know are alternate on the branch. And again, these principles become more useful the more you practice them. OK, so that's the elder one of the few trees that has opposite buds. Here is the blackthorn. And here you can see that they're laid out in alternate, alter, alternately along the branch. You can see one, two, three. They're not in opposite pairs. And interestingly, we have the uh, blossom just coming out there as well. That's an interesting photo because with blackthorn, mostly the blossom is out before the leaves, but here, it's slightly coming out at the same time. So it's a bit interesting what's happening with that. But I'm getting off point. Are the buds and leaves opposite or alternate? That's important to know. Okay, folks, those are the three key principles. I've rushed through them a bit. If you want to know more, I'm gonna send you a link where I go through that and slow it right down. But I'll be referring back to them throughout this um, workshop. Let's dive in to the spring tree calendar. because we're gonna start, um, we're actually gonna start before spring, then we're gonna go through March, April, May, and just touch into June. And this is important to understand the spring tree calendar because we're not just looking at what to look at, what does this flower look like? If we know when we should see it, we can then eliminate certain trees from what we're looking at. For instance, let's show some examples of what comes out because tree for your guides, thing is they will say, oh, here's, the um, flower, this is what it looks like. But often it doesn't tell you when the flower comes out. It might do if it's significantly early or very late in the season. Um, we might just say the flower comes out in summer, but there's a big difference between a flower being out in June or a flower coming out in August. So we're gonna have a look at it in a bit more in detail, unpack the information of what flowers come out when. And I've got some nice examples of that. Okay, so here we go. Right, here we go. We're gonna start before spring. So heading slightly back in time from where we are now, a few things that you'll see in the lead up to spring. 
And number one is elder. And it's these elder leaves. We just saw a picture of them in opposite pairs earlier. But here are the young leaves. And this photo was taken in January. It's the first tree to come into leaf, the native tree to come into leaf in this country that loses its leaves. Of course, evergreens have them all year round. But in um, late winter or very early spring, you might see elder leaves around the place. So look out for those, okay? Now, the other thing to look out for in uh, before spring are these little gems of a flower. And we did cover these in the winter workshop. These are the tiny red flowers of the hazel. OK, the female flowers and they're like little sea anemones poking out of the uh, coral there with their little tendrils. And these are tiny, tiny little flowers. And these will take the pollen and eventually these will become the nuts, the hazelnuts that we all know. But these are on the tree. They could be on the tree in late January, maybe through February or through February as well. And I walked out in the woods uh, yesterday and I saw them out and about then. So they're in late winter and early spring. And we'll see some more from the hazel a bit later on. So something else to look out for in the lead up to spring, okay? And as we can see there, some, another little fact there. Have a look here where the cursor is. Do you see the little fuzz on the twig? That's the hairy hazel, which is a nice little rhyme to remember you've got a hazel twig because the young twigs are hairy. You can see that there. Okay. Here's another beautiful one that you will see in the lead up to spring. This is the older, and these are the female flowers which will eventually will become cones. And older is really interesting because it's one of the only broadleaf trees we have in this country that has little cones that look a bit like pine cones. But these are like little purple cotton buds, I think. Um, and that, uh, you've probably all got at home there. And a really beautiful kind of pink and kind of light purple color, a really lovely thing to look out for. And the buds of the, and the catkins of the older have a purple color as well, although duller than this. But that's a really beautiful thing to look out for, and it's really unique. There's nothing else like that um, in this country that looks like that. So if you're seeing that um, in late winter, early spring, you've got the older. Okay, so there's a few for um, before spring. Now we're going to move into where we are right now in March, okay? And some of you in the country might already be seeing this. Where I am in northeast Wales, we haven't got this blackthorn blossom yet, but it is just round the corner. And uh, I suspect in southern Britain, you might already be getting this. This is the blossom of the blackthorn, Prunus spinosa, which is a, um, a tree that you will see in hedgerows and along roadsides. It's usually kind of like 60 to 80 percent of hedgerow mixes is made up of blackthorn and hawthorn between the two. So you will see a lot of this about. And because there's so much of it at roadsides and at pathsides, and because there's a lot of it in the hedgerow, the blossom really stands out because we suddenly see it everywhere because we're driving in our cars, walking along the streets, and we see the hedgerows and the, uh, the road verges. So it's a really good one to look out for. It's the first blossom to come out um, in this country, and uh, it doesn't last uh, too long, but what's significant is that the blossom is out before the leaves. So we're seeing all this white blossom before we see the green leaves of the blackthorn, okay? Here it is from a distance. You can get a really good idea of what you're looking out for. Um, and as, as I say, I'll be looking out for this in the next couple of weeks. You've got that sea of white and also that scrubby growth there of the blackthorn all coming out. And because that blossom is early, it's really important for our pollinators. It's one of the first bits of nectar they can get their hands on. Just behind, actually, interestingly, in this picture, do you see this green here? The green behind? That's the hawthorn coming out. And whereas the blackthorn comes out with its blossom first, the hawthorn comes out with its leaves first. So we'll be touching on that in a second. Here's the hawthorn leaves in detail. They are the next to come out in the hedgerow. Okay, you get that bright, fresh spring green of the hawthorn leaves, which then darken off later in the season. Um, but they're a really good one to look out for because you'll see the white of the blackthorn and the bright, fresh green of the hawthorn, often side by side, planted right next to each other and intermingled. So they're really unmistakable. But do take a closer look at the hawthorn leaves because they're beautiful. They're like miniature oak leaves in a way, quite strongly lobed. Um, and uh, yeah, really good stuff. Um, comes out early, very fresh spring green colour. And again, the blossom of the hawthorn isn't out yet. We'll get to it. So you've got blossom of blackthorn, hawthorn leaves. Okay, that's the order in the hedgerow there. Right. But there's other things happening now. I've already mentioned one of the things that are out and about, and that's catkins. 
We've got some catkins here, which are really making a show now. I've seen them just starting to come out with some of the willows where we are, but you'll start to see this out and about in the hedgerows, hillsides, country parks, wherever you're wandering about, the willows and the poplars. Now, willows and poplars are closely related, so they have a very similar kind of life cycle throughout the year. And what's interesting about them is that they are getting away early. They're doing all their pollination now and getting it started early before the rest of the canopy closes up. And they, they're getting all these catkins out before the leaves as well, which is interesting. So you're seeing all of these across the trees right now. And this is the goat willow, otherwise known as pussy willow or great sallow, um, a few different names for it there, but it's Salix capria is its um, Latin name there. And it's called pussy willow because the little catkins, when they come out, are like little fluffy furry cat's paws that you can stroke. So that's why it gets that common name. But let's have a little look a bit closer. There we go. There's the goat willow a bit closer, the male catkins there. And you can see they've got that really furry look to them. This one's a little bit younger. This one is starting to get a bit mature, starting to show some pollen. OK, so there are the catkins of the goat willow. Look out for them in early spring right now as we're in March. As I said, we don't just have the willows producing catkins, we have the poplars as well. Aspen, white poplar, black poplar, grey poplar, um, all the other kind of uh, hybrid poplars which are out there, the cultivated varieties or ones brought in from elsewhere. But we're mostly talking about our native tree species here and the ones that are naturalised. On the left, we've got white poplar, okay? And on the right, we've got black poplar. Um, and these pictures are interesting because white, black poplar, you'd think there'd be a lot of difference there, but that's not referring to the, uh, the catkins. As we can see, they both got that red color to them. What the black and white is referring to is more the hue of the tree overall. So the underside of the leaves of the white poplar is very white, like, uh, like the covered in talcum powder, and the young twigs are very white, and the bark is a light gray, whereas the black poplar everything about it is much darker, it kind of, the trunk sucks in light really, um, it's more dark brown, but you know, compared to the white poplar, it's black. So that's what we get there. But those are the catkins, you're gonna look out for those in early spring and you might be seeing them now. If you are, you can pop it in the chat room in a sec. Okay, another one that you might notice if you look very closely at this time of year is the juniper. It's not one that we have much around here, um, but just have very tiny little green flowers and they're coming out in March. But another one that people might not know is this one, the witch elm. And it's out in March as well. It's either out now or very soon. And it's a beautiful little flower. Now, elms have been very much hammered by Dutch elm disease, but a lot of them do come back again after they've uh, back kind of been killed off. They regrow from their root or they sucker out and put new growth on. Um, and this is what's happening where I am. We have a lot of witch elm in my area in Northeast Wales, a lot of it producing kind of new growth, like a kind of messy scrubby hazel. What the witch elms rarely do is get away into a large tree. But with all these young kind of bushy growths, um, all kind of um, down at our level, we get a chance to appreciate the flowers close up because they're not way up in a tall tree canopy. And I always think they look like, um, like a burst of fireworks, like a, a, you get on bonfire nights bursting out like that. And you get this beautiful purple color of the flowers there. Now this is witch elm. If you want to look for English elm, if you're lucky enough to find any, um, the flower is redder than it is on this one. This is more purple, but the English elm is a more deeper scarlet red flower. Okay. So moving through our calendar now, we're kind of leaving early spring and we're going to mid spring now. So we're talking about April into May now. And there is a lot of stuff that comes out now. This is when the majority of tree flowers and of course wildflowers are appearing. So what we've got first is, um, well, in no particular order in this season is field maple. Now field maple is a, is a kind of a, is an acer, so related to sycamore. Um, field maple is our only native maple though. And you notice that the leaves are out there. The leaves are out coming out the same time as the flowers. And the flowers are pretty unobtrusive. They're not going to win any uh, beauty prizes, but they've got their own beauty. They're very small, um, probably only about so big, the little clusters of flowers. And they're green, as you can see, with a yellow hue to them once the pollen um, starts to mature on them. But they're a nice little flower to look out for. Um, and I said they come out the same time as the leaves. So you look out for that field maple in hedgerows. It's a smaller maple 
and it's got those kind of maple-like leaves like the Canadian flag, like a hand-shaped leaf, but they're in miniature, whereas the sycamore is much larger. Look out for these flowers. Um, the other thing to look out for in mid-April is once the catkins have come out, our willows quickly follow with their leaves. They come out afterwards. And the reason why I picked these pictures, because I want to draw your attention to what's going on here with these three leaves and the underside of this leaf and the general hue of colour you're getting in this wide shot here. It's a pale pastel green. That's what we're seeing here. And when you look at new leaves coming out, as I said with the hawthorn, it's a very fresh, bright spring green. But with the willows, it's much more subdued and dull on the underside of the leaf. Um, and often when the wind blows, you get that colour showing through. And so when you look across the landscape, you start to see trees which have a very kind of um, pastely grey green colour to them. And those are going to be willows, most likely. Whereas with hawthorns and other trees, it's a much brighter, fresher, vibrant green, as we'll see in our pictures. So it's a nice little hint to know, to zone in and get your eye in for looking at what's going on in the wider landscape. It's something you'll notice with practice. Ash is a really interesting flower in the middle of spring because this is the early flower of ashes. It's just coming out and um, it looks like it's got some kind of fungus problem or perhaps it's got a load of raspberries growing out of it. It's a little bit strange. It looks like, has it got an infection or are those galls there? But these are the flowers bursting out. You might notice as well that the buds are in opposite pairs. One, two, one, two. So buds are in opposite, not alternate here. Let's follow the flower as it emerges. Here we go, the flowers bursting out of the end of the twig there, and we get a hint of their colour there. And, you know, the reason why I want to show you all these flowers is because, you know, they're beautiful, and most of us will pass them by and not think about them, or maybe not notice them, because they're not out for very long, but these ash flowers are really, really beautiful. And look at the colours there on those. They're going to burst out even more, and this is them fully mature, really quite big. They can be kind of this kind of big, spewing out as big as your hand from the tree there. Um, really beautiful, a lot of growth there coming out of the tree, but we'll notice some closed buds on the twig as well. They'll, they'll contain the leaves, which are going to be out a bit later. Here's a picture taken in the studio, so you can really see the difference. You can see the closed up leaf buds here. These will have the leaves, um, but these are the buds that contain the flowers, and they've opened up. So the buds on the twigs, some of them have leaves in them, some of them have flowers, and that's how that works. But there's the mature flower of the ash. Look out for it in mid-spring because it really is beautiful. Um, you really love your one to look out for. Here's another one. Uh, we noticed sycamore. Um, we mentioned it earlier related to our field maple, um, Asa pseudoplatanus. It's not a native tree. It's been brought into this country. Um, but it's got some pretty spectacular flowers. And it's interesting to compare them to the field maple that we saw earlier, which is a small little green cluster. OK, so notice the young sycamore leaves coming out at the same time as the flowers, but these are very young. Let's look at them when they're mature. Here we are a few weeks later, much longer, you can see compared to my hand, much more pendulous and open. And they've lost that darker colour, they've lightened up, but they are much bigger than the ones you get, the little ones you get on the field maple. Everything about the sycamore is big, um, big leaves, big buds, big flowers and um, the big kind of winged helicopter seeds as well. So good one to look out for. I'm whizzing through these little bit, guys. We've got lots to get through, but we can always look at them back. I'm just showing you the diversity of flowers, really, rather than going through the full details. This is beech. Um, again, another tree that we might not think of as having flowers, but of course it has. We think of beech with its leaves, its canopy, dense, its beautiful grey, smooth bark, and under the floor, all the nut cases, the beech mast on the floor and the leaves on the floor. But check out these flowers here. These are the male flowers here, laden with yellow pollen that you can see dangling like little pom-poms um, from the twig there. Really beautiful um, uh, flowers. Also the leaves, could you notice a little silver fringe around the leaves here? And here, a little hairy fringe. You get that with the young leaves. That's something to look out for. Here are, this is the female flower of the beech. And I think it really resembles the, the beech mast. Um, and that's of course will become the beech nut in time, it's got that same kind of kind of cup-like look to it. So there's the young beech flower. Not very spectacular, but there it is. Some more spectacular than others. Here's the hawthorn. So it had its leaves out first, and now finally, in late April to May, we get the hawthorn flower. 
Okay. Now, another name for the hawthorn, another common name, is Maythorn, because the blossom traditionally came out in May. But you will see it from mid to late April as well, depending on where you are. But it's at its best kind of at the start of May. Now, by this time, the blackthorn flowers have well gone. So if we're seeing all this white blossom in the hedgerow now, it can only be hawthorn, really, um, if it's in the hedge, because the blackthorn blossom has passed. So this is where that spring calendar starts to become useful, knowing where you are in the spring and what flowers we would expect to see. Wild cherry, we all look forward to the cherry blossom. There's a lot of cherries on housing estates and in urban areas planted up. A lot of them won't be the wild cherry, a lot of them will be a cultivated variety, but still, they do flower around the same time. Um, and this is one in our local village, with all the beautiful um, blossom coming out. And uh, another one that's interesting, we're gonna come back to the cherry in a bit. This is the oak. And the oak is a tree that we don't really think of as having flowers. Um, you may well have noticed them, but it's not something that people really talk about. We talk about the leaves and we talk about the size and the majesty of the oak. And then of course the acorns, but we don't really talk about the flowers. And there's the male flowers there all dangling down as you can see like little catkins. Not very impressive in the grand scheme of things, but they have their own beauty, their own texture. Um, I think they give the, the tree a really kind of crinkly look. At this time of year, you can spot that texture from a bit of a distance off. So it's a good one to look out for. And uh, this is really coming into late spring now. So we're really getting um, into kind of late April, May now um, with these flowers. So the oak is last, but also look, the leaves are out at the same time as well. Here's a better picture taken in studio of those male flowers. You can see at the same time as the young leaves. And they, they obviously just look like smaller versions of what we know as the oak leaves, but also a lot lighter and brighter, a vibrant green. Compare that to the willows that we saw earlier with the pastel colour underneath. And we can start to notice the difference of the colours in the canopy as we look at trees from a distance. Okay, um, here's a good one that most of you will, well, I hope a lot of you will recognise, the horse chestnut, the conker tree, with its spectacular flower. I said everything about the sycamore is big, everything about the horse chestnut is huge. Huge sticky buds, huge leaves that spread out bigger than your hand, huge tall flowers and the massive conkers of course. Everything about this tree is big and the flowers aren't an exception as you can see. You do get a red variety, I think it's an American one, um, which is, uh, I think we call it the red horse chestnut over here. Um, but you do get that sometimes planted in urban spaces. So if you see these flowers and they're deep red or pink, it is a horse chestnut. It's just uh, a variety from elsewhere or another species that's come in um, and been planted. But this is what we see um, with the naturalized version of the horse chestnut. Um, and you get these tall spikes of flowers, which bees absolutely love in the back end of spring. And you'll really notice these from a way off because there's not really anything else that has flowers like these apart from one thing which we'll get to. Then as we get to the end of spring, the rowan flowers come out in their clusters, their umbels, and then we get the elderflowers very last, okay? The elderflowers, which of course we all know for wild food. So they come out at the end, and we'll come back to those later because they look a little bit similar. Now, I'm gonna send all you guys a guide after this. Um, if you're watching on YouTube afterwards, you can click the link in the description, you'll get a link to this free Spring Trees Flower Guide that I've created. And you can see that I've arranged it in order of when you expect to see things. And so you can use that as a bit of a spring tree calendar to help notice what's out there. So uh, you'll get that via email, guys. If not, you might have it already. So that is a quick whistle stop tour of our spring tree calendar. Okay, so yeah, somebody said, Tracy says, I always wonder what the candles were um, with the horse chestnuts. Yeah, they're often referred to as candles, um, those trees. Now, as we just talk about late spring into summer, there's a rhyme that people might have heard. Um, now, where's the rhyme? Ash before oak, in for a soak. Oak before ash, in for a splash. I wonder how many people have heard that old country law, that rhyme. And what that's referring to is the leaves, really, rather than the flowers. It's saying that if the ash comes into leaf before the oak, we're going to get a very wet summer. If the oak comes into leaf before the ash, we're going to get a dry summer, a nice summer ahead, thinking about the farming calendar and sowing crops, that sort of thing. But actually, um, 
is there any truth to it? Well, studies have been made about this. And studies show that actually the ash has only beat the oak on a handful of occasions since the studies have been going on, um, at least for, for decades anyway. Um, and perhaps it's just kind of country optimism at play because the um, oak pretty much always beats the ash. And they're saying, hey, we're going to have a great summer. So that's what I like to think. But even though maybe the rhyme doesn't have too much truth to it, what it is useful for is reminding us when we're identifying trees in spring of which two of our natives are the last to come into leaf. It's the oak and ash because they're both in the rhyme. So that tells us that if we're looking out at the canopy in late spring and we're seeing a lot of trees which are green and we're seeing some which haven't got any leaves on yet, it's a good bet that it's either ash or oak. So we can start to zone in like we did with the pale uh, pastel green of the goat willow leaves and look out and look for trees that don't have any leaves on yet. They're either dead or it's an ash or oak tree. Um, so that's something to look out for. So that rhyme does still have some use for us. Okay, and also because they're very common trees, oak and ash in our landscape, in fact, I think the ash is the third most common tree in Britain. Um, it's very useful because you're likely to see them out and about, of course, and most of us know oaks anyway. Okay, folks, let's get on to catkins. And we touched on these a little bit and we've gone through uh, tree flowers, but we're going to go back and look at some catkins now because they're a special type of flower. They are long, um, pendulous flowers and um, dangling from the twigs, swaying in the breeze, and you get the males of those releasing pollen on warm, sunny spring days, and you can give them a tap and they'll release the pollen for you. You can see that. Great for your hay fever, of course. Um, but the catkins on willows and poplars, as we said, appear before the leaves. And the reason for this is so when the pollen blows from the catkins, then they're less likely to hit all the leaves and get blocked. They're more likely to travel further. So the tree is freeing up room for the pollen to travel and then the leaves come out afterwards. So that's what's happening there. And there's more likely that the pollen will reach hopefully another tree to uh, let nature do its work. So nature's pretty clever like that. And they, um, those trees are relying on wind dispersal to spread there with the pollen. Um, let's have a look um, at some examples, actually. And uh, many of the tree catkins we look at can actually be seen as early as our previous autumn um, because they take a while to mature on the tree. Um, so here's some examples of the goat willow catkins again, not quite mature. We can see a little bit of pollen there on that one. But let's have a look here at catkins. We've got the older here, Alnus glutinosa. We saw those beautiful kind of pink cotton bud flowers on it earlier. But these are the male flowers, which are catkins. Here they are in the winter, not looking very spectacular on the left there. Um, they do have um, a nice purple color to them usually. That's quite a rotten example there. But what I want to demonstrate is how they mature. If we look at the picture on the right, we can see the mature older catkins, and this was taken just two days ago, and they've really elongated out. They've got a greeny yellow color to them, and we can see how now they're going to open up and spread the pollen over to those young female flowers. And actually, on the older there, we've got the old cones from last year still hanging on, so that's a really good sign that we've got the older tree. It's the only broadleaf tree you're going to see which has cones on it, pretty much, in the countryside, so it's a really good feature to look out for. So the catkins will mature as the winter and spring progresses. This is hazel, the other one that we'll know for catkins, and all those catkins are looking like they are on the right of this picture right now, okay, because they are doing all their work early, much like the willows and the poplars. But way back in kind of uh, back end of uh, autumn and winter last year, the catkins are looking what they are uh, looking like they are on the left there. And also we can see the hairy hazel twig there again on that picture on the left, so that's quite useful. But look at the difference of how those catkins mature. And that's something we can really get our eye into and look out for at this time of year. Okay, so catkins do um, mature as time goes on. But here we go, this is interesting. Are trees male or female? Now, you've heard me talk a little bit here about kind of, oh, these are the male catkins and this is the female flower. But are trees or plants male or female? Okay, but here's a good example. This is the birch, okay? And on the birch, we have the male catkins dangling down, but also on here, we have the female flowers. You can see them sticking up just here and here where my cursor is and also here. 
little green spiky flowers which have an upward sweep to them. Those are the female flowers. So the birch has both its male and female parts on the twig there, okay? It's not separate, they are together. Let's unpack that a little bit further. We've got a couple of uh, uh, fancy words to learn for the night. Uh, monoaceous, I think is the best way to pronounce it. If a tree is monoaceous or wildflower or plant, that means that it has both its male and female plant parts on the same tree, okay? If it's diaceous, which is what we get with willows and poplars and some other trees, it means that there are male trees and female trees. And you need a male and female tree in order for them to pollinate with wind dispersal, okay? So if you've got a whole area with male goat willows and there's no females around, they'll never make any new trees, okay? Um, so that's how that works. You have monaceous trees and diaceous trees. And this becomes important when we're identifying trees in spring because we need to start to know what we're looking at. Because we're gonna go back to our goat willow here, okay? Here's the goat willow, those catkins that we're familiar with. These are the male catkins. Now take a look at this. This is the female, and you would be forgiven for thinking this is a completely different tree. But this is goat willow, Salix capria, same species, but this is the female, and the catkins look totally different to what we have with the male there. They're green, they're spiky, very different character them, and of course, they don't have any pollen on them because the females don't produce the pollen. They are wanting the pollen to blow over to them. So it's good to know which plants are diaceous because then there might be differences between what we see in spring between the male and the female tree. Okay, that's really important. Now, um, let's have a little look what we've got next. Here's um, some other examples here. This is the aspen. So an aspen is a popular, uh, a popular, sorry, um, populus tremula named after its trembling leaves in spring, um, summer. But these are the male catkins, gray, brown, hairy, which is interesting because, you know, um, this looks more like what you'd expect a mature female catkin of a willow to look like. But let's look at the female of the aspen, totally different. And again, is this a different tree? No, it's not. This is just the female, um, nice and green, very different, not that brown hairiness, okay? so. We're going to get to know those as well uh, through the spring, so don't be fooled by that. Um, and there are plenty of other signs we can look out for to identify these trees as well. But, of course, <laughs> with the female catkins, they are also going to mature and they're going to become fluffy. And anyone who's got maybe poplar trees or willow trees that they park under um, their car or they have to sweep them up by the pavement or in their garden on the driveway, they will know that these things get everywhere once they mature and you get these fluffy seed heads blowing all over the place, which is beautiful on a, a sunny kind of May day, even early June, blowing about the place. But they all land on the floor like this. But this is something we could look out for on the floor. We could pick it up and we could say straight away, oh, we've got a willow or a poplar above us. And then we could look closer in late spring and start to find out what actual species of tree we've got. So with the uh, um, diaceous trees, not only have you got the male and female catkin, but you've kind of got the mature female catkin as well, which looks quite different, as you can see, from what we had um, there. There's the immature goat willow, and then there it is mature, getting much fluffier, and then it all on the floor there. So lots to take in at the end of spring. And also guys, I'm gonna send you as well via email in the next couple of days, a catkin guide that I've created. Um, and you can see again, I've put them in order when you'd expect to see them. And these are some of the most common catkins you'd expect to see. And I've put on the guide, whether they're male or female in the picture. So I'll send you that via email as well in the next couple of days. Or if you're watching after the fact, again, there'll be a link to that in the description below. So lots of free resources to help you understand what's going on in spring. Okay, folks. Okay. Right, what I wanna share with you now is a few more tree flowers because there's some real beautiful gems out there which when we slow down and tune into our environment, we can spot in spring. We've seen a few already, like the hazel and the older flower. But there's a few others which are really worth your attention. And it's a real kind of real pleasure when you find them out in the countryside. So let me show you these different ones now. Three of my favorite little flowers out in spring that you may not know about. First of all, hornbeam. Hornbeam, a tree that often gets confused for beech, 
because the leaves look very similar, um, the kind of um, oval uh, flattish leaves um, with pointed tip and then often kind of smooth grey bark. There are differences and if you want to know more about that, have a look at my winter tree ID workshops. But looking at the flowers, they're really useful to us at this time of year in identifying trees because the beach flowers look nothing like this. If we think back to the picture I showed earlier, they were like little yellow pom-poms. Whereas these ones, we've got the male catkins there, long and pendulous. And on the left, these are the catkins at the start of spring. And on the right, there's the catkins at the end of spring. And you can see how they've elongated and opened out to spread their pollen. At the start of spring, do you notice the little pink sections in it in between the scales there? You've got the green and pink, that's quite unique to hornbeam. So it's something to look out for. Okay, so we're comparing the early male and late male catkins there. Here's the female, and this is the one I wanted to show you on hornbeam. It's a beautiful flower. It looks like something tropical or something, again, like a sea anemone with tendrils coming out. A bit like the hazel flower, although it's bigger, I would say, with this. It's quite a bit bigger, about so big with this one. Here it is early on the left. It's tube-like. Um, looks like it's poking out like those, uh, those are sea anemones from coral. But then there on the right, it's mature. And you can see it's opened out a lot more. But as I said, still only about so big, these flowers. But it's a beautiful one to look out for. So don't just uh, think of the sea of green when you're out in the spring. And look at these details of these splashes of colour that we're getting on our trees. And the hornbeam is monaceous. So the male and female are on the same tree, um, which we see here. There's the male and female flowers together on the same twig there, as you can see, just to prove the point. OK. Here's another one that I like, spindle. Now spindle is a tree which can often get kind of missed in the background, certainly in winter. It blends into the scrub with your blackthorns and hawthorns and in early summer as well. Um, not too much to kind of uh, uh, shout about. Later in the year, it gets very exciting with spindle. But looking at it from distance, you can kind of see are there some flowers on there perhaps? If we get a bit closer, we know just something pretty special. I wonder if how many of you can spot what's special about this flower, and it's something I've not mentioned yet. It's the number of petals. There's only four, four petals. Most flowers on trees have five petals. So straight away, this is interesting, okay? Now, it's a very small flower. They're only tiny, but there's lots of them. And they're in a cross like that, uh, which is interesting. They're in a, a perfect cross like that, which mirrors the twigs, because the twigs can often be out at uh, 90 degrees as well to the branch. Now, they're green, they're small, and there's four petals. But there's a little rhyme I like to remember, to remember this is the spindle. And I say spinning spindle, because I think of these looking like the sails on a windmill, your classic Dutch windmill with the four sails spinning round. And I think of those spinning in the wind and think of the spinning spindle. That's how I remember them. It's an easy little rhyme that will get stuck in your head, perhaps. But look out for them. Four little petals in a cross. Very unique. There's not a lot out there like that. But that's the spindle and a really good detail. And pay attention to this tree because later in the year, it's going to get pretty spectacular. But last of our three cool flowers to look out for is the oak. We've seen the male catkins already, but I want to draw your attention to the female flower. It's small, it's pink, you can see it at the top of the picture there, um, but it's a beautiful little splash of pink at this time of year in kind of like late April, early May this is coming out. You can see the, how young those leaves are, they've still got a real shine to them, um, really glossy look to them already. And actually you can eat the young oak leaves when they're out like that if you want to. Um, so yeah, um, those are the pink flowers of the oak, beautiful little flowers, and you can see them here with the male catkins below, and there's the pink flowers at the top bursting out of that um, a scaly bud there, and there's the leaves as well all coming out together there in a big old um, spewing mess. And there's a beautiful splash of colour on our oaks that maybe you've never noticed before, but I really like it. Oh, time's marching on, we better get on with this. Let's move on quickly to a couple of trees I want to draw your attention to bird cherry and wild cherry. Two trees which sound similar in name and are closely related. They're both prunus, both in the, uh, the, uh, the, the plum family. But let's have a look at their flowers. Now here's classic wild cherry blossom. Five petals, white, 
looking like cherry blossom, okay? Cultivated cherries will be um, often pink or can have lots of different varieties like double amount of petals or much more density of petals. But our wild cherry out in the countryside looks like this. So this is what you'd be looking for. But have a look at this now. Here it is again, growing in a cluster, okay? And that's important because we're gonna look at it in difference to the wild cherry, to the bird cherry. And remember this as well later when we talk about other white flowers. Here's a picture I took in studio and what this really demonstrates is how the flowers grow. Do you notice how they all grow out in a cluster, like a fan like that? They all come out from one point in a cluster. That's really important because when we look at other white flowers in a little while, we'll see how they don't do that. But cherry flowers, wild cherry, prunus avium, grow in a cluster. Now let's compare it to bird cherry. Totally different, as we can see. So very similar name, closely related, but look how different those flowers are. They are white, five petals, but it's the arrangement that's different, isn't it? They remind me of horse chestnut, which is what I was hinting at earlier on, but they're a little bit smaller than that, not as big. And they're not as cone candle-like. They are more of um, a banana, for want of a better term. They've got a slight curve to them. Um, they're not just straight up in a cone, they curve slightly. And uh, this is really unique. There's not a lot else out in the countryside that you'll see looking like this on the tree. This is bird cherry. So if you see this in spring, it really shouts out. And it's a good one to know because the rest of the year, bird cherry doesn't really have anything too distinguishing about it that really um, shouts out easily to the eye. Spring is really its season where you notice it from a distance and it really shouts out to you. Also, the flowers themselves have a really kind of um, strong smell of almonds when you smell a really nice, strong smell of almonds. And they're not the only flower that smell like that. But the flowers also appear at the same time as the leaves. Whereas with the cherry, the blossom is out just before the leaves. So there's another difference. But really, between that wild cherry cluster and the banana-like spike of the bird cherry, you're not going to get them confused now. You're going to know the difference between the two. Okay. We're going to whiz straight on through, guys, to some other flowers because we started to get some basics now. We're going to go in a little bit into depth. All these four pictures are from four different species of flower. And I put these deliberately together just to kind of confuse and muddy the water a little bit. These are four different species of common trees in Britain. Some of them we've seen already, okay? We're going to break it down and have a look at them because the thing is, in spring with trees, there's a lot of flowers that are white and have five petals. That's the most common thing you're gonna see. So let's break it down a bit and have a little look. And we're gonna bring in our spring calendar again. Firstly, we've got the blackthorn. There it is there. Blackthorn, white, five petals. But if you remember our spring tree calendar, it's early that it comes out, isn't it? Earlier in the season, it's out before anything else. So if you're seeing it in March, it's gotta be blackthorn. If you're seeing a flower like that in May, it's definitely not blackthorn. So remember that, okay, guys? That's really important. Um, you're gonna see it on mass in the hedgerows as well. And that's what it looks like growing. Less in a cluster, like we saw with the wild cherry. See how it's spread across the whole branch there? And there it is again, that picture which shows it from a distance. Okay. Now the hawthorn, I've gone back to the leaves again, just to bring home that point. The leaves come out first with hawthorn. Blackthorn blossom, hawthorn leaves. So this is kind of uh, March time, we're seeing this. But now in late April, May, we get our Maythorn or Hawthorn flowers. Five white petals, um, but they str smell strongly of almonds or marzipan, much like the bird cherry. But as you can see, they look very different. So if you're getting that almond smell, and it's really strong, some people say too strong, but I like, I like it. I've got a sweet tooth though. It's the Hawthorn, okay? And you can eat these. Um, okay, it looks very different from the bird flat, uh, bird cherry, but also you might get pink hawthorn as well. You do get it out in the countryside here or there. Um, sometimes there's just a bit of pink in there. And of course, in towns and urban areas, there might be cultivated varieties where they've really bred the pink in and you get that stronger. But look at those leaves at the back. Um, and when we talk about trees in summer, we'll go into the leaves in more detail. But the leaves of the hawthorn are very distinctive. Okay. All right, so this one here, we've got crab apple, Malus sylvestris, our only wild apple. And here we have a white flower with five petals. Looks very like the cherry, looks very like the blackthorn as well. But again, it's time of year. 
we're looking at this in kind of April, May. That's when we're seeing this. Um, but with this flower, it's larger than the others. It's the largest one of all our kind of white tree flowers as an individual flower. Of course, the um, bird cherry spike is much bigger, but individual flowers, these are the biggest for a start. But the other thing is, have a look at how they're opened out and the petals have gaps between them. See the air gaps between the petals? When they're fully open, that's really quite noticeable. And that really reminds us of something which is really handy. Here's the core of an apple. If you slice it crossways, you get this five pointed star, which reminds us of the flower, the five pointed flower there. They look very similar, don't they, when you cross it across. So it's a nice little trick to remember the apple tree there. And of course, you'll get this with cultivated apples. Now, cultivated apples often have a bit more pink in them, um, either very pink or a little bit of pink, whereas the crab apple usually is just white. There could be a bit of pink in there. Of course, there's a lot of cultivated varieties of apples around in the countryside, and a bit of cross pollination is going to happen here or there. But think of that five pointed pattern there and how you've got those gaps between the pips. It looks like the center of an apple. There's another thing to look out for with the crab apple, which is the leaves. Um, quite distinctive, kind of oval leaves, don't look anything like the hawthorn or the cherry leaves, they're much longer and have a more toothed edge. But the other trick with apples is of course, look on the ground. There's probably gonna be some rotten apples falling on the ground. So if you're getting confused with all the different blossoms and flowers, look for other clues. That's the point of this picture. Have a look at the bark, have a look at um, what's fallen on the ground, what the young leaves look like. And with the crab apple, there's a perfect sign that's exactly what we've got because the apple of course doesn't fall far from the tree. Just briefly we'll go over the rowan um, and we're going to compare this with the elder which are at the back end of spring. Now the rowan has five petals, uh, white flowers, but they're growing in a cluster, okay? A cluster called an umbel, um, an umbel of flowers um, together and they're quite similar to the elder in that way because you have a compound leaf, a leaf made up of lots of leaflets. And those leaves are what are called uh, pinnate. And you can see that clearly here. This is a compound leaf. That's one leaf made up of lots of leaflets. Okay, and it's a, comp uh, it's a pinnate leaf because it has pairs of leaves with one at the end, a terminal leaf, okay? Now with the rowan, the flowers do look similar to the elder, but look at the leaves that are there. There are between five and eight pairs of leaves usually. So you can have up to 11 to 17 leaflets on one rowan leaf, whereas the elder will see it's different, okay, and we'll compare that now, okay. With the elder, first of all, the flowers are a bit more fizzy and they have that elderflower smell. If you've ever had elderflower cordial, champagne, you will know the smell when you smell it, okay. On the left there we have some flowers that haven't quite opened up yet, and on the right we have some flowers looking really good, okay. Again, clusters of flowers. Now interestingly, um, with the elderflowers, they can actually have between three and five petals on them, but really you're only gonna notice that if you're really close and it's not, not the most distinguishing feature I go for. Um, so I would, would probably, you know, you know, look at that if you're looking close, but if you're looking that close, you've probably seen other signs that we're gonna notice. The other thing about elderflowers is that generally they're at their best after rowan. So as rowan come out in May, the elderflowers are at their best in June. They do come out in May as well, but they're at their best in June. So they're a little later in the season. Here's the elder flowers again. I have a look at the leaves. They're also compound leaves made up of lots of leaflets, but there's less of them, okay? There's usually only between uh, uh, five to seven leaflets per leaf, whereas with the rowan, they had a lot more. So there's one leaf here with five leaflets on. So there's a lot less between them, okay? So that's the difference between those, okay? And also the other big difference is going back to our key principle. We said, right, to start the workshop, are the leaves in opposite pairs or are they alternate? With the elder, you might remember that the leaves are in opposite pairs, whereas with the rowan, they are alternate on the branch, okay? Right, folks. Time is marching on. Very quickly, I'm gonna rush through some wild food opportunities. And I just made a video about making birch syrup. Um, and now is the time to do it. Back in the February and right now at the start of March, there's not long of the season left to go. You can tap birch trees to get um, syrup. And you tap that from by getting the sap from them. I made a whole video on the YouTube channel about that. 
um, which you can check out for free and see my whole process and my successes and my failures and what I learned through the process, trying out different techniques. So I won't go into too much detail here, but the point is there are trees out there that have got lots of wild food for us. And here's some of the best stuff that trees can offer us in spring. On the top left there, we've got beech leaves. Beech leaves are good eating. They've got a nice tangy taste to them, but only when they're first out. And this is true of many leaves. They're good when they're first out, but as soon as they start to build up their cellulose and darken off, they become leafy and they lose their flavor. And it's real kind of a bit of an effort to chew through them and they're not palatable. So you'll feel that. So you want these leaves when they're first out. On the right, we have lime, which is a tree we've not talked about yet. They don't have flowers till summer, which is why we've not mentioned it. But those young leaves there, you can see here, growing right on the trunk, are good eating. Um, really nice stuff thrown into a salad. Um, and you can also use them to wrap food in. I've seen somebody um, make little parcels of food with rice and wrap them in lime leaves. That's a really sweet trick. On the bottom left, we've got the blackthorn blossom. You can pick those and put some of them in a salad if you wanted to decorate it. You won't get any taste, but it will make you feel better. And then in the middle, we have the hawthorn leaves. When they're nice and young, they're good eating as well. Not a lot of flavor to them, but it's a good bit of wild green that we can get into a salad or a sandwich or throw into our cooking right at the end of the dish if we want to. And then on the right at the bottom, the hawthorn blossom later in the season. Again, it's got that strong almond smell to it, um, but you can throw those onto a salad as well, or you can even candy the flowers. That's something that I'm looking forward to doing at some point. Another tree that we touched on earlier is the witch elm. Uh, remember that little purple um, firework of flowers? These are the seeds which are out in spring a bit later on, not long after the flowers at all. And they're really good to eat, you know, you can pickle these or you can ferment them and they taste really nice. They take on the flavor of the kind of vinaigrette, whatever you put on them, but they're good to eat. Really nice when they're soft. When they get older, they're going to go brown and papery and they're no good. But check them out. They're good stuff. One reason why I'm mentioning all these wild foods, of course, is that we run wild food workshops, which I'll talk about in a sec. We have elderflower as well. Everybody knows elderflower cordial, elderflower champagne. I think the elderflowers are probably the king of tree wild food in spring. It's the best stuff. And hopefully in late May to June, you guys can be harvesting lots of elderflower and making some good stuff out of it, leaving some for the bees, of course. And as I mentioned, we do wild food workshops every month. So we don't just run these free tree workshops. Every month we do a wild food workshop, um, which is ticketed, but we have special guests and uh, uh, from the world of wild food and foraging and bushcraft coming in. And we talk about the best of wild food each month. I'm gonna send you a link to that where you can check that on our website. So wild food workshops that we do every month. Okay, folks. Now, that's lots about trees. Whew, a lot of information in a short space of time, but I'm gonna send you the recording um, as soon as it's edited, so you can look back at that. But if you're interested in knowing more, I'm gonna tell you about where you can get some more resources. And then after that, we're gonna do a quick Q&A. Looks like we're gonna run over by about 10 minutes. So I hope you guys will stay with me. But I wanna tell you about some other resources you can get hold of because I created during lockdown, a tree ID course. And I think a lot of you guys that are here tonight are actually already on the free taster course that have signed up for the workshop tonight. So, so hello to all of you. And I hope that all of you have enjoyed the free taster course so far. It's called Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills. And if you like what you've seen tonight, you can find out a lot more about what's um, happening in the trees all through the year. I've made this free course. So I'm gonna send you a link to this via email, okay? It's free to sign up to, no commitment. And it covers three tree species in four seasons. So winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And you can look at the changes, such as with the ash tree, with all the flowers, and then the leaves, and then what's happening with it in autumn as well. And then the winter twigs and buds. Um, and there are video um, lectures for each one. You also get these downloadable guides. So for every species, you get these little PDFs that you can either print out, or you can put them on your phone um, when you're walking out and about, and you can look at them. And these break down all the key features. So you can see, for instance, we've got hazel in spring there in the top left. It shows you the kind of the four things to look out for to tell you in spring you've got hazel. So some really nice picture guides and these are all free to get on the course. Um, also, there are photo galleries with loads of pictures all through all four seasons of different trees, the three different trees in the course and what they look like. And you can uh, look at all those pictures as well. And um, a lot of them, the pictures from tonight are from the course, okay. So that is free to do. Um, there's some pictures in studio as well. 
um, that I've taken myself um, of all different trees. And you can see we've got dead leaves in winter, we've got spring flowers, we've got summer leaves, autumn leaves, all four seasons. You can really understand the tree and get to know the details. Okay, so that is um, the free course, guys, okay, which I'm going to send you. Now, for those of you who have already done the course, or those of you who want to know even more, the exciting announcement that I mentioned at the start of the workshop is that that taster course is just a taster. I've made a much bigger course, which is called the Complete Tree ID course, okay? And there is a cost to that one. Um, but this one takes you through up to 35 trees. It's going to get even bigger as well. It's going to be 50 eventually in all four seasons, okay? Um, and if you're interested in this, I'm going to be launching a special offer on this one as well um, in the next couple of days with 10% off on that one, which I'm going to send to everybody who's attended this workshop. So look out for some emails. It's called the Complete Tree ID course. It's 35 native and common trees in all five seasons. You get live workshops with me. So we do that four times a year where it's just me and the paid students. And we find out where you are at with your learning. Um, we give you some quizzes, some games. We look at different details, talk about what's going on each season. Um, you get more cheat sheets. So you don't just get the three you get on a free course for those three trees. You get sheets in all four seasons for all 35 trees. So there's a lot of information on there. So, and you can dip in as a, however you want. So whenever you start the course, you, um, you can look back into winter and look at all the trees then. You can look at what's happening in spring. Um, you'll get to look at the summer stuff as soon as that's released in May. And you can also get one-to-one -one coaching with me as well on the course, that's an option. So if you really wanna build your tree skills and really become a bit of a tree expert and get to grips with what you're looking at, then I'll do one-to-one -one coaching. That's an option on the course as well. And we've had lots of people join who have really enjoyed it. We've got over 2,000 people on the free course, which is fantastic, who've taken the free course so far. So that's amazing. And that's a really great feedback from it. So as I said, if you really enjoyed this free workshop tonight, I hope you'll sign up for the free course. If you love that, I hope you'll sign up for the paid course. And there's loads of different options about signing up for that, which I won't bore you with now because I filled your head with a lot of information already. But as I said, that's called the Complete Tree ID course. And uh, it's, um, as I said, uh, out now and available. I'm very excited about it. It's been our answer to um, outdoor education during lockdown, because of course you're not been able to teach out and about in the wilds, have we? Um, but we've created this and it means that people from all over the country can get to know trees. So if you wander out in the wild and not know what you're looking at, do check it out. And you're gonna get an email tonight with a link to the free course. That's quite enough advertising for now, I think. Let's do some open uh, Q and A's. Let's do some question and answer, okay guys? So if you have a question, pop it in the chat room and I'll do my best to answer it about spring trees or winter trees if you're on that workshop as well. Okay. If anyone has a question, do let us know in the chat room. Lots of people saying thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate your time, spending time here. Are willows always near water? Carolyn asked that, Carolyn in Vermont. Hello. Willows love water. So if, you're, if you get to know what willows look like at all times of year, when you um, are looking at the wider landscape, if you're seeing willows, then there's a good chance there's water there. Um, because they soak up a lot of water, they like wet ground. The exception to that is the goat willow, which is the one that we've kind of featured tonight, Salix capria. That does survive all over the place. It's much hardier, um, so you don't just see it in wet areas. It likes wet too, but you can see it on hillsides and uplands as well. So goat willow kind of breaks the rules, but generally willows are an indicator of wet, damp ground. Any hints for finding hazel, Eleanor asks. Yeah, so that little red tiny flower is still out and the long dangling catkins at this time of year. And hazel um, isn't a, ever a big tree. It's usually a scrubby, shrubby tree with lots of stems growing from the ground. So you see lots of kind of straightish rods coming out, very much a hedgerow, woodland edge or understory tree. It's very rarely a large tree. Um, it's usually scrubby because people traditionally cut it down and it wants to just grow as many stems as it can. Um, but if you join the free course, hazel is one of the uh, trees featured, so you'll see it in all four seasons, so you'll get loads of details about hazel. Mirelli asked, if a tree has female catkins, does it mean it has flowers? Are catkins flowers? Catkins are a type of flower, but they don't really have petals, do they? They're different. So um, the female catkins um, do have, um, on the willows and poplars, they're dangling pendulous. There are trees 
that do have just female flowers. So holly, the reason why you don't always see berries on holly is because hollies are either male or female. Male hollies don't have red berries, okay? So the holly females do have a flower though. I think it's a little green flower off the top of my head, but it's more a traditional flower. Whereas with the willows and poplars, they're all long catkins, okay? But the holly is an example of one, and the juniper is one as well, it has just female flowers um, rather than catkins. So you touched on lime. I'm just looking at, are there any key identifier species for the lime in spring? Um, with the lime, it's going to be the leaves. I haven't got any pictures of them to hand, but they are heart-shaped leaves. And we just saw a little picture in the wild food collage that I did, but very bright, fresh lime green, um, nothing to do with the lime fruit, but very heart-shaped. So a pointed tip and then heart-shaped at the back, like a child would draw a little heart. That's what they look like with the lime. And often with limes, they are planted in urban spaces because they do well there. So they often line, line streets. And also with limes, you do quite often with some species of lime, get epicormic growth, which is growth coming out the base or side of the trunk, very bushy. And people don't like that on pavements. So the councils cut it away, but it's the tree trying to prolong its life. It's a natural process that it does. Um, but often you get an epicormic twiggy, bushy growth as if there's a bush growing out the bottom of the tree. But look for those very bright green heart-shaped leaves for lime. And in summer, we might touch on the summer flowers of the lime, which will come out. Um, so Emma's asking, will you be doing a conifer workshop? So Emma, the tree ID course up at the minute covers three conifers, just our three natives, the Scots pine, the juniper, and the yew, okay? I am gonna make a course all about conifers in Britain, like Sitka spruce, larch, Norway spruce, Monterey pine, all the stuff that you see, but that's my next project, one project at a time, but I will do conifers. But if you're interested in those three conifers, the natives, then have a look at the full course and you'll find out about that. Emily says, any good book recommendations for native trees? Well, of course, Emily, the best resource I can recommend is my tree ID course. However, I was anticipating your question, so I brought some books along <laughs> that I've got. So two books that I use all the time. Um, one is the Collins Guide to British Trees. It's very good. Um, lots of photos. I like illustrations myself because the illustrator highlights um, the particular key feature, but it's a good solid book. The only thing I'd say with this book and um, with a lot of tree field guides is that probably 50% of the pages are trees that you're unlikely to see. So you're kind of sifting through a lot to get to the main ones. So in my course, I boiled it right down to the kind of 35 to 50 eventually of the ones you'll see as opposed to the probably two or 300 which are in here, but it's a good book. Another one is the Reader's Digest Guide. And what I like about this one to Trees and Shrubs of Britain is that it's all illustrations. Um, but again, we've got the Almond and the Medlar. I've opened it there. Two trees that you probably won't see that much of out and about. So there's a lot of trees in here um, you're not gonna see, but it's all good information as you flip through. It's a beautiful book, good one to get secondhand online because it's been in print for a long time. Reader's Digest Guide. And what I do is I take out a book that's got photos and I take out a book that's got illustrations. So I've got those two to compare. But if you want a really quick, easy guide, I would recommend this. This is produced by the Field Studies Council. It's only about four pounds to buy. It's called the Tree Name Trail. And it's good in spring and summer because it's got the leaves on. In winter, it's not very useful. But at this time of year and going into summer, it's a great thing to stick in a backpack when you're out and about. It's from the Field Studies Council. It's on their website. Um, check it out. It's a nice resource and it's a little bit splash proof too. Um, if you have any other burning questions, um, you know, drop me a line. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, drop a question in the comments. I'll do my best to answer it. And for everyone watching for live tonight, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Um, a lot of information tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I'll see some of you on the uh, course, either the free course or the full course. And I'm going to send you some emails with some information about that spring offer where there's going to be a 10% off, which is starting on Monday next week for a limited time, just seven days, 10% off the full course, which will get you into 35 trees in all four seasons and with all those resources that I've shared tonight. So look out for that. But whew, that's a lot of talking. I'm going to have a, a, a sip of water. Thank you again for your time, everybody. I really appreciate it. Stay safe. Um, enjoy the countryside as lockdown gets eased. And isn't it great to see all the green coming back now and all the spring flowers starting. So yeah, enjoy the countryside guys. And hopefully I'll see you, if I don't see you 
anytime soon. Hopefully I'll see you in summer when we'll be doing these free workshops all over again. So look out for that. I hope to see you on the course. Look out for the email. Take care, guys. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Stay safe. Bye-bye for now. Bye, folks. <laughs>